Hey guys, my name is Tom and welcome to part 6 of my networking tutorial series. As usual, check out the previous parts of the series first if you haven't seen those yet. In this video, we'll simply be moving the server code into Unity. If you get stuck along the way, check out the code on GitHub and come join our Discord server. I'll leave links to both of those in the description. If you're wondering why we'd move the server code into Unity after initially building it in a console application, let me explain. In order to handle things like collisions and hit detection, and assuming we want to keep our solution server authoritative, the server needs to be running some sort of representation of the game world. Mainly for performance reasons, this instance of the world doesn't need to and probably shouldn't be as intricate and complex as its graphical counterpart on the client side. However, if the server is supposed to authoritatively handle collisions, it needs some way of knowing where a player can and cannot stand. In a 2D game, this could be done with a sort of map which the server can check to see whether or not a specific point in space is a valid place for a player to be. In 3D games, it's more complex. Obviously, it'll depend on exactly what kind of game you're building, but a good option is to use a physics library and have actual colliders the same way you would in a single player game. In my personal project, I've made use of a physics library called Beppu Physics, which has allowed me to keep my server running as a console app. I'll leave a link to the Beppu Physics GitHub page down in the description. For any kind of production releases, it would be ideal to keep your servers as console apps. However, the goal of this tutorial series is to teach networking. Making a tutorial about implementing a third-party physics library such as Beppu Physics could easily take three videos by itself, not to mention that it'll add unneeded complexity to an already difficult topic. To avoid this, while still being able to make tutorials about things like server-side collisions, I've decided to move the server code into Unity. This will allow us to take advantage of Unity's built-in physics, and chances are, if you're watching this, you're already at least somewhat familiar with that. So, to be clear, having the server in Unity adds a bit of extra overhead, which isn't ideal for projects which you plan to release on a large scale. However, it'll make it much easier for me to produce more of these tutorials, and it'll help keep the level of complexity to a minimum, so it'll be easier to learn this stuff too. With all that out of the way, let's move the server code into Unity. First, create a new Unity project. I'll name mine Unity Game Server, but you can obviously name it whatever you like. Create two new folders, one for scripts and one for prefabs. In the scripts folder, we're going to create nine C Sharp scripts called server, server handle, server send, thread manager, packet, client, constants, player, and network manager. Then open up the server script as well as the old server console app. This part will be very repetitive. Copy over the contents of the server class and remove the inheritance from mono behavior. Throughout this process of copying everything, there's going to be quite a few errors, most of which will go away by the time we're finished. Don't forget to include the system, system.net, and system.net.sockets namespaces. Then copy over the contents of the server handle class and remove its inheritance from mono behavior. Do the same for the server send class. Now copy over the contents of the packet file. Make sure to include the class and the two enums, but not the namespace. In the write methods for vector 3s and quaternions, make sure the component names are lowercase. At the top, make sure you have the system and system.txt namespaces. Next, take the contents of the player class and copy it over. This time we want to keep the inheritance from mono behavior since we'll be attaching the player script to the player prefab later on. Now copy over our constants. Then take the contents of the client class and move it over. Don't forget to remove its inheritance from mono behavior. A lot of the errors right now are being caused by all of our console.write line statements, which obviously won't work in Unity. By pressing Ctrl and F, we can use Visual Studio's find and replace functionality. Put console.write line in the top box and debug.log in the bottom one. Make sure the dropdown is set to entire solution and then hit replace all. When prompted, hit yes. This will automatically replace every console.write line with debug.log throughout our entire solution. We still have to copy our thread manager over, so do that now. Then add the system namespace up top and call the update main method from inside fixed update. Back in the client class, include the system, system.net, and system.net.sockets namespaces to fix all these errors. In the player class, most of the errors can be resolved by simply making the fields we're accessing lowercase. We'll fix the last error in a moment. Back in Unity, open up the server's project settings. We'll be using Unity's fixed update method to replace our custom loop since it'll be called regularly. However, we want to make sure it's running at the rate we want. By default, the fixed time step will be set to 0.02, .02 which results in 50 updates per second. If we want a tick rate of 30 the way we had it set up in our console app, 
we need to change the fixed time step to 0 0.03 repeated, which is also what it's set to on our client. Back in our player class, delete the top two lines in the move method. We don't need them anymore. Replace the now missing values with transform.right and transform.forward respectively. Then, instead of updating our position field, we actually want to update transform.position. Delete the position and rotation fields since those are also no longer necessary. We can directly use Unity's transforms now instead of manually storing positional information. We don't need to initialize those two fields anymore, so remove the references to them. In the client class's send into game method, we can no longer create new instances of the player class using the new keyword since it inherits from mono behavior and that isn't allowed. Instead, call the player's initialize method passing it the same values as the constructor. Then change the player class's constructor to a proper method called initialize. Back in the client class, we still need to assign a value to our player field before we can call any methods on it. We'll create a method in our network manager class to do just that. Since we'll be instantiating a game object to represent the player, we also need to make sure to destroy it when a client disconnects. Next, implement our singleton pattern in our network manager, which we've been using on the client. Additionally, add a game object field called player prefab. Then create a method called instantiate player, which will return a reference to the player. Inside, simply instantiate the player prefab and then return its attached player component. Now in the player class's set input method, change rotation to transform.rotation to resolve the error. To fix the remaining four errors, add transform to the dot notation wherever it's required. Finally, we still need to actually start the server somewhere. This used to happen in the program class, but that doesn't exist anymore. Instead, we'll add a start method to our network manager and then call server.start from inside. Unfortunately, this causes some problems. The Unity editor doesn't shut down sockets when exiting play mode until you enter play mode again, which means that the port you use will be taken until you enter play mode a second time. If you've been testing in play mode and then build the server, this will prevent the built server from starting because only one application can bind to a specific port at one time. Additionally, when I was testing this code before making the tutorial, I found that when using my public IP to connect to the server, the Unity editor seemed to be blocking the connection. My ports were forwarded, and the connection worked fine with the console app server, as well as the built version of the Unity server, so I'm convinced it's an editor problem. Because of this, I've decided to prevent the server from starting in the editor. If you'd like to test using the editor, that's fine, and you can simply skip this step, but you'll have to deal with the issues I just mentioned. To prevent the server from starting in the editor, simply check if the Unity editor keyword is set to true. Back in the editor now, create an empty game object, rename it to something like Network Manager, and attach the Network Manager and Thread Manager scripts. Save the scene, and rename it to something more fitting if you like. Now we need to make the player prefab. Create another empty game object, name it Player, and attach the player script. Then drag the game object into the prefabs folder and delete it from the scene hierarchy. Next, open up the prefab editor, add a capsule as a child, and rename it to Collider. I decided to remove the mesh filter and mesh renderer components since they're not necessary, but if you plan to test in the editor, it may be worth keeping them so you can visually see the player. Exit the prefab editor and drag the player prefab object into the network manager's open slot. If you hit play now, you'll see the debug message telling us to build the project in order to start the server, so let's try that. Open the build settings and click add open scenes. If you renamed your scene like I did, you'll have to remove the deleted scene that's still in there. Next, make sure to check the server build box. Enabling this will make the Unity project run without graphics and it'll look almost like our console app. Then hit build and run and choose a file location for the build. If you're prompted, make sure to allow the program through your firewall or clients won't be able to connect. Now hit play on the client and click the connect button. You should see our welcome message pop up in the console, and a player object should be spawned. However, you'll also notice that the player moves around extremely fast, so let's deal with that. Back in the server's player class, you'll see that we're handling movement in the update method. Previously, when our server was a console app, this method was being called once every tick by our server loop, but now that it's in Unity, it's being called once every frame. Since the server has no graphics to render, it's running at several hundred frames per second, if not several thousand. So to prevent our player from shooting off across the map, we can simply change our update method to a fixed update method. If you build and run the server and connect the client again, you should see that the player now moves at a normal speed. 
You may have also noticed that the player's movement is inverted along the x-axis. To fix this, simply switch the signs for the x component of the player's input direction. Build the server again, and when you connect you should be able to move normally. Before disconnecting, open up your task manager. If you look at the CPU column, you'll see that our server is using around 8% of my CPU. Why is this? Well, it comes back to the fact that the server is pumping out frames like there's no tomorrow. This is completely unnecessary since the actual logic is running at 30 ticks per second, so let's limit our server's frame rate. Open up the network manager class again, and at the top of the start method, set the target frame rate. I set mine to 30 since my server is running at 30 ticks per second, but if you have a different tick rate, don't set the target frame rate any lower. You don't need to exactly match your tick rate, but put some sort of limit on it so that it's not running at something like 1000 frames per second. In order for this to actually take any effect, we need to disable vsync, so set quality settings.vsync count to 0. Finally, if you build the server and connect to it once more, your task manager should show a much lower CPU usage. Anyways, that's it for this tutorial. If you found it helpful, please take a moment to help my channel grow by smashing the like button. In the next part of the series, I'll demonstrate how to implement server-side collisions and will improve player movement, so make sure to subscribe. If you really want to make sure you never miss an upload, don't forget to hit the notification bell so you always know when I upload another video. With that said, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you again next time.